Welcome to the History Talks. Today we will finish our three part on Emperor Tiberius. To watch the rest of the Ancient Rome series up to this point, click the I icon in the top right of the screen for a link to the playlist. A year after Germanicus's death, Tiberius's son Drusus was appointed to the consulship, and later shared his tribunican authority with him. This was somewhat unusual, as the Romans viewed one of the things that distinguished their emperor from a king is the lack of a hereditary succession, but due to how Drusus proved himself during the mutiny situation at the beginning of Tiberius's reign, it was seen as acceptable. Unfortunately for him, Drusus was murdered by poisoning, and at the time the culprit was not known. The death of both his own son and Germanicus made it seem likely that Tiberius would have one of Germanicus' children be the next emperor, despite seemingly none of their names coming up in sources as being of particular note. Instead, one of the most powerful figures was Lucius Aelius Sejanus, or Lucius Aelius Sejanus, who was initially captain of the Praetorian, which in that time was the guard of the city of Rome. However, he was slowly given more title and authority within the bureaucracy by Tiberius. Tiberius spent less and less time in the cities, including in Rome itself, often being in the countryside, not uncommonly on his own estates, though he did sometimes travel around the empire dedicating temples, but he largely delegated the task of ruling to the bureaucracy, a habit he ramped up especially in his final 20 years. There seems to be a discrepancy between coinage, which depicts Tiberius using much the same terms as was used for Augustus, and Tiberius' own actions in regards to the imperial cult. When permission was requested to build a temple to Tiberius and his mother, Tiberius rejected the proposal and explained why in a speech where he essentially said that he's not quite divine, contrasting himself both with Augustus and with mythological features like Hercules. Throughout the 20s AD, there seems to have been a pattern by the government of accusing various wealthy Roman patricians and, in some cases, senators, of treason in order to seize property from them. Historians of the time primarily blame Tiberius for this phenomenon, though they do at least admit the Senate's role in this happening. Factors outside of Tiberius are probably even more strong than, than described due to Tiberius' habit of delegating responsibility and because of Sejanus. One piece of evidence, for example, is that two of the figures that died that were convicted in these purges and later died were Germanicus's sons, which may suggest that all of this was part of an attempt by Sejanus to eliminate political rivals, Sejanus himself eventually getting appointed to consul. Tiberius trusted Sejanus both for the reason that he was reasonably competent at his bureaucratic work, and also because they had a strong personal relationship. Tacitus writes about an anecdote of Sejanus saving Tiberius from falling rocks while they were nearby a cave. Curiously, Tiberius both had st statues erected of Sejanus in Rome, and he wrote in letters his doubts about Sejanus as an emperor, and seemed to indicate that he did not want Sejanus to be his heir, despite the reverence he otherwise sh seemingly showed for Sejanus. However, the fall of Sejanus did actually end up being caused by Tiberius. Tiberius made the active decision to acquit a man which Sejanus had accused of treason. It's not exactly known why, but one suspected reason has to do with the fact that the man had only recently been appointed a governorship by Tiberius, and so he may have seen it as an insult. Public opinion was already weary of the situation of so many men being accused of treason, and now that an accused who seemed to have explicitly been an enemy of Sejanus had been spared by the emperor, public opinion swayed heavily against Sejanus, though that did not stop it public opinion from being low of Tiberius. Soon after, Sejanus was summoned by the Senate under seemingly inconspicuous terms, but he was then thrown in prison. Though the exact crimes he was sentenced for are vague, it seems some sort of conspiracy charge was stuck on him, and Tiberius' daughter Livia, who also seems to have been Sejanus' mistress, was also implicated in the conspiracy. Tacitus also adds that the trial revealed that Sejanus was responsible for the pointing of Drusus, but the trial was eight years after the crime had happened, and so it's not known whether this determination was really made, and if it was really made, how it was really made. With the fall of such an important figure, the already weak and messy question of succession was made worse, not by, helped by the rather lethargic response of Tiberius. He appointed Germanicus' youngest son, Caligula, as quaestor, and then wrote that both Caligula and Tiberius' grandson through Drusus, Gamellus, would be co-emperor in his will. 
Tiberius is said by Tacitus to have gotten more involved with po politics directly after the fiasco with Sejanus, but he still lived outside of the walls of Rome, and he largely relied on the bureaucracy first established by Augustus and then made powerful by Tiberius and his delegatory ruling style. T Tiberius died at age 77 in 37 AD, not very well liked at the time of his death due to all of the drama that occurred under his purview, as especially evidenced by the fact that authors, even those from after Tiberius' death, describe his final years as emperor as him living a gluttonous lifestyle in his villa four miles outside of Rome. After Tiberius has died, as according to his will, the emperorship was, was given to Caligula. However, Caligula's first act as emperor was to nullify Tiberius' will, such that Gemellus would not get any of the power he was promised. And that concludes our ep episode on Tiberius. Make sure to like and subscribe if you enjoyed the video, or if you didn't enjoy the video, and make sure to leave a comment if you have any suggestions, and we will see you on the next episode of The History Talks.